So it's also a real pleasure to introduce Ziad Ali. Ziad Ali is be well known to the audience as one of the major innovators in many fields of interventional cardiology. But perhaps what's less well known is that Ziad has actually been involved in lithotripsy since its inception. And I can think of no one better to ask about how IVL therapy is adapted to the vascular space. Ziad. James, thanks so much. Uh, you know, it's really meaningful for me to be involved in this mechanism of action talk because we struggled through a lot of this during the inception, uh, and it was quite a process to get here uh, 10 years later. So I get the fun task of talking to you about what's under the hood in IVL and how IVL is adapted for the vascular space. Well, shockwave is generated for medical use traditionally based on extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, which as you know, is used for renal calculi. There are three main technologies that are used to generate shockwaves for external shockwave lithotripsy. The first one is basically a spark plug. A spark plug with two electrodes in which an electrical arc is created between the two in a fluid filled cavity, and that creates an unfocused energy that becomes focused based on a reflection from the ellipsoid reflector. So that's unfocused energy that hits this ellipsoid reflector, kind of like a flashlight focuses the light to go forward instead of spreading everywhere. Electrohydraulic energy is the important one because that's predominantly the one that's used in shockwave IVL. There are some other methodologies and that's electromagnetic. In an electromagnetic system for the development of a shock wave, you have a coil, an electric coil, and as that electric coil generates energy, it bends a membrane, kind of like a dome, just in front of it, and that creates a focused energy, which is then focused either by a parabolic reflector, like in the electrohydraulic, or by a lens that focuses the energy uh, into uh, increased amplitude. And finally, there's the piezoelectric crystal. So when you line up these piezoelectric crystals, which can also create electrical energy, um, and you put them together and activate them together, these piezoceramic elements can also create a focused energy. So this had to be an, adapted to intravascular lithotripsy. And the adaptations required the placements of these emitters, which in this case are the electrohydraulic uh, mechanism, into balloon catheters that could be used in clinical cardiology in the vascular space. And there are three, the integrated balloon, the C2, the S4 and M5 are used for peripheral while the C2 is used for coronary. Now these have different properties. The M5 actually gives you up to 300 shocks, the S4, 180 shocks, and the C2, sorry, 160 shocks, and C2, 80 shocks. You'll see on the right side, the generator, which is a relatively uh, simple looking device, but with a lot of work under the hood. It's connected quite easily to a catheter with a button on it that activates the energy. And then of course, the balloon is at the tip. Now, what we're gonna do is go through some of the adaptations that have allowed us to use this device intravascularly. The Shockwave IVL incorporates several adaptations to this re regard. And we're gonna talk about the energy flux density and waveform modification, how we're integrated into an IVL balloon, and then of course, the emitter alignment. So let's start with the adaptation from the waveform energy. This is the hardest part. So in green, what you see is the energy waveform of an extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy for kidney stones, for example. And what you'll notice is that very early on after a shockwave is generated, you have a very high peak pressure followed by quite a substantial negative pressure and then sort of what looked like some aftershocks. What you'll notice in the inset is a blue shockwave IVL energy pattern. And when you look at that in the context of the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, you'll notice that the magnitude is significantly decreased. And while it may seem that you can just turn down the dial, it's not so simple. And in fact, that requires a tremendous amount of engineering so that you maintain safety, but still have enough energy. 
And if we look at this table on the right side, you'll notice that some of the energies for extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy are very, very high indeed, and simply inapplicable to any vascular space. A peak positive acoustic pressure of 300 to 1100 atmospheres, peak negative acoustic pressure of 80 to 150 atmospheres are simply way too high to be used internally inside the vascular space. And you'll notice that moving from focused energy from the extracorporeal system to the intravascular unfocused system allows some dissipation of energy and the peak positive pressure is much more akin to things that we would try to achieve in interventional cardiology, interventional vascular therapy. And that is 50 atmospheres of positive pressure, very little negative pressure, and I'll talk to you more in detail about why that's important. Peak negative acoustic pressures around three atmospheres, and then a penetration depth, which is three to seven millimeters, covering the vast majority of the vascular space. You'll also note there are many primary mechanisms of calcium fracture in the extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, but the intravascular lithotripsy largely relies on compression stress. So what happens is that the integration of these uh, technologies into the balloon could lead to heat. And so one thing that needed to be engineered was to make sure that we weren't creating charring or very high temperatures during the arcing that could actually lead to a biological response within the artery. In fact, this was the first question that we received from some of the funding bodies that were approached very early on in the inception of IBL. But what you'll notice actually is that the temperature changes with each cycle of 10 pulses is really very, very small. And within the standard deviation of of even one degree Celsius. So temperature is really not a factor and thus heat injury of the vessel wall is really not an entity here. The next thing is of course, mechanical stabilization. Well, obviously if you take a balloon and you undersize it so that it's floating within the lumen of the artery, then the energy that's created will be dissipated not only into the wall, but into the liquid interface, in the movement of the balloon within the artery itself and Thus, energy will be limited to get into the vessel wall. By sizing the balloon one to one or 1.1 1 .1 to one, you'll notice what that does is stabilize the balloon to put it directly in contact with the calcium and therefore allows the energy to be transferred more directly through its shockwave into the vessel wall. It's important to understand the different emitter alignments between the different technology used in peripheral and coronary IVL catheters. In the coronary IVL catheter, there are two emitters and the emitters are placed four millimeters from the radiopaque marker of the balloon. Then that's the first emitter, then six millimeters followed by a two millimeter gap and the radiopaque balloon, a uh, marker of the balloon. That's important because it's a little bit more difficult to see the emitters than the radiopaque markers. And what you want is to have the emitter immediately adjacent to the maximum calcification because you notice in red, this is the field effect. The field effect is largest immediately perpendicular to the emitter itself. Now the C2 catheter has two channels the S4 channel um, catheter has four channels, but the M5 channel is rather unique or a catheter is unique because the middle channel receives its own source of energy. And that's why you see a larger field effect. And in fact, this will provide you the highest amount of energy towards a calcified segment. So what are the effects of IVL on vascular calcium? We've done important experiments on heavily calcified cadaveric superficial femoral arteries by performing both CT and microscopy, allowing us to examine exactly what's happening to the calcium in vivo and in vitro. So here in this situation, in a heavily calcified SFA, 180 IVL pulses are performed. And following those pulses, you see that this leads to fracture of the calcium within the vessel wall, further fracture as we deliver more energy. And then when we look at these under micro CT, you'll see compared to the baseline, on the bottom panel in B, you see multiple different fractures. And this is highly relevant 
Because what we're used to seeing on the optical coherence tomography images are longitudinal fractures in a cross section. But of course, this is unfocused energy. And what you cannot see in that situation is things such as chips of calcium or calcium fractures that may not be happening completely in the axial plane to the OCT. This would be analogous sort of like delivering energy and blowing the roof off of the house. You might not be able to see that, but nonetheless, the damage would have been done. And that is a mechanism by which uh, the efficacy of IVL may be underappreciated with regards to visible fractures on OCT. And this is evidenced more by histopathological examination. When you look at low um, power magnification histopathology with hematoxyl and eosin and compare it to the CT, you see these cross sections of fractures suggesting that these are actually occurring both in vivo and these are not just artifacts uh, on um, CT examination. These fractures can occur in multiple planes because of the unfocused energy. And again, this may be one of the mechanisms by which we have greater yield of the vessel wall compliance compared to the visible fractures on OCT. What about the effects of IVL on soft tissue? Well, this is a study of, histo uh, of eight pigs in which uh, the pigs underwent 180 pulses of IVL at four atmospheres, followed by the recommended balloon angioplasty at four atmospheres, and had a histomorphometric analysis. This is a nice randomized control trial in the sense that the comparator plain old balloon angioplasty compared to IVL shows that there's almost no difference in important healing metrics for the vessel wall. There's no difference in the injury score, inflammation score, endothelialization or neointimal smooth muscle cells. And the disrupt CAD 1, 2, and 3, and 4 have provided insight into the mechanism of action in vivo and shown repeatedly that calcium fracture leads to an improvement in vascular compliance and as a result allows us to expand stents circumferentially and uh, further provide luminal gain. And this is evidence of that where we look at the pool data from Disrupt CAD 1, 2, 3, and 4, we notice that there are shifts from the pre-procedure to the post-IVL, but this shift is really pales in comparison to post-stent, where what happens is the yielding of these tectonic plates as described uh, in the next slide. So you'll notice again that there is a fair increment over time in this data from Disrupt CAD 3. And this is what I was mentioning earlier on. In panel A, you'll notice that calcium fractures occur early after intravascular lithotripsy. But once you place the stent, these gaps or box patterns actually yield significantly further, creating further expansion within the vessel wall. In panel C, you see a single linear fracture in a segment of calcium that's less than 180 degrees. But you notice that the stent is expanded radially in the non-calcified segment but a large gap is created where the stent pushes these two tectonic plates away. We also know in follow-up studies by OCT that fortunately that this space fills with neointimal tissue and not recalcification. When we look at the effects of IVL in the peripheral artery system, the results from clinical trials show that one-year patency rates are significantly better if the optimal technique is used, i.e., to have an IVL balloon sized one-to-one -to, -one to maximally allow the field effect to penetrate into the vessel wall and also to use something called pulse management, which makes sure that you're delivering energy to all of the calcium, not only the most calcified segment of the vessel. So in summary, this technology has been integrated into a semi-compliant balloon through a lot of very careful engineering. The acoustic waveform has been specifically adapted for vascular calcification through a lot of sophisticated engineering, not as simple as just turning down the dial. IVL is safe on soft tissue because these acoustic pulses are soft on soft and hard on hard. The impedance of water and soft tissue are actually very close, but the impedance differences between liquid and hard bone or calcium are magnitudes different, which allows these differential effects to occur. As a result, 
IDL has the ability to modify superficial and deep vessel wall calcium without the need for high pressure inflations. An appropriate balloon sizing and technique is associated with improved outcomes.